I guess we start at the beginning. What's the current um, SIL situation? So if, if people are living in a SIL situation at the moment, it's typically in group homes, maybe. Are you, are you able to sort of explain some background around that? Yeah, so SIL is uh, supported independent living, which is the funding that you get from NDIS uh, for when you need some significant presence of a support worker for your day to day tasks. Um, they give you that sort of funding based on a functional assessment, but we can talk about that in a little bit more detail later. Um, a lot of people, when they think of supported independent living, their mind does typically go straight to a group home, but that's not um, how it has to look like or what it looks like even in most cases, I would say. Um, but if we're speaking about a group home first, it would essentially be a pool of support workers um, that is funded through individuals who live in the group homes, um, NDIS plans, and each pay a portion um, of the funding that goes towards having those staff there, usually 24 hours a day. Um, and that portion that they pay is dependent on their, um, their needs and their, the assistance that's required for them to do the day-to-day -day activities uh, when they want to do it and how they want to do it. Um, and uh, so it, it is individualized in that sense. People do look at um, the individual person's schedule um, and then they combine that for everyone living in that particular home in order to determine both the rates that's paid, but also the care ratio, so the amount of staff that are put on um, to support those people. Um, our so they're living in that scenario um, yep. in a house and they're sharing a house, but they've got separate bedrooms. That's right. And some right. bathrooms as well. It depends on the house. Um, the most typical one I see is usually a house shared between two or three people. And there's usually an extra bedroom that operates as an overnight on-call assistance room, which essentially just staff quarters. Yep. And, and I guess so that's that's not what we're not what we're doing at the moment with um, accessible what homes. Doing. Yeah. So that's the, that's yeah. And it's certainly not the model that MS Queensland uses for our um, other sites yeah. as well, though our other sites are a little bit different to the way that you're doing it at Palm Beach and, and any other future projects that you have. Um, did you want me to talk about those a little bit? Yeah, so give us a bit of background on what's happening in the MSQ space at the moment and where you're at with some of the SDA projects you've got that are already underway. Yeah, so we've got um, existing projects that are the oldest is about two years old now in Springfield, but we have them peppered all around Queensland. So we have existing sites with different types of setups at Albany Creek, um, Annalee, Springfield, Southport and Bundle, um, and then upcoming projects at Rabina um, and a couple of builds that are just getting started now, ready for next year in Toowoomba and Caboolture. Um, the model that we typically use at those sites is independent dwellings. So no one is in shared accommodation. Typically people have their own apartment. Those apartments are usually one or two bedroom and the more contemporary model being the two bedroom setup. Um, and we build to the high physical support standard, the same as Accessible Homes Australia is doing at Palm Beach. Uh, accessible Homes, uh, sorry, the high physical supports in a nutshell means that a lot of the physical environment has been built in a way um, with considerations to people using mobility aids for most of their mobilizing and still being able to interact with their environment as much as possible. So things like, you know, the gaps under the kitchen bench so that a wheelchair can get underneath and people can engage in some cooking tasks or um, assisted technology that helps you turn on lights, open doors, um, control the air conditioning and the blinds, that sort of thing in a nutshell, because there's a lot more to it, as you know, um, but that's yeah. the sort of thing um, that's in a high physical supports home, apartment, duplex, whatever it looks like in terms of the build. But our sites yeah. are usually between eight to 18 separate individual apartments. Um, and then that's broken down into smaller numbers where a group of support staff will be available 24 seven, including awake overnight shifts for the people living in this home. So it means that they have their own space, they have their own apartments, they can have friends and family come over as much as they like, they can go out as much as they like, but they'll always have staff presence on site that's just a nurse call buzz away um, for any of their assistance that they might need with their day to day. So the idea behind it is a lot more independence um, and a lot more free time or time where you're not surrounded by other people if that's not what you're looking for. Yeah, so still or supported independent living, that funding, um, is that the same as your, your sort of core funding in your in your plan or is it different funding? Is it, it separate? Is. 
It's separate funding. So if you have an NDIS plan at the moment where you are utilising your daily activities funding under core for your support staff uh, for what usually looks like drop-in supports, SIL does sit separately to that. So SIL is based on a quote that the provider of SIL um, does up. Um, they get you to check off and make sure that the information that they're putting on there is, um, is accurate and it's what you want it to look like. And then that's submitted to NDIS. Um, and that's where the fund funding is generated from as well. Um, you know, sort of as that occurs, um, uh, SIL is funded almost like when you have assistive technology, you might have a, a part in your assistive technology budget that says wheelchair, quote required. And then the quote that is funded from NDIS is in addition to the rest of the funding that's in your plan. So that's right. what it looks like. Right, so it's not, a, it's not affecting the core sort of um, supports funding in a sense. You know, you go and get a review and, you know, your plan gets reviewed and you ask for SDA, but you're yeah. obviously going to have to ask for SIL at the same time. That's right. right. The good thing about SDA funding, um, which pays, of course, for your bricks and mortar, um, is that, that getting that approved by the NDIA doesn't cause an automatic plan review. The plan review for that occurs when you actually want to move into that property and utilise those funds. So you right. yeah, approved at a maximum level. They tell you what that level is, the, the variables that are within that. So if it's single occupant dwelling, apartment complex, what category of SDA, so that's the high physical support that we were talking about before. Um, and then you know what your maximum budget is and you can help uh, find a property based on that, which is what my team assists people to do at both our MS Queensland builds, but also of course for you guys at Accessible Homes Australia. Um, we help you navigate using that funding. Um, so that happens. And then the second part of that is the SIL quote. So for um, someone that's using core daily activities, if there are things that um, your drop-in supports are currently doing that might be moved across to SIL, it can decrease the amount of funding that's in your daily activities core. You just need to know firmly what you want to use your, um, what we might call scheduled supports for. So what tasks you want them to do, how often in the day you want them to do drop-in, um, whether they're doing your overnight supports or you want to rely on a SIL provider to do that. As long as you've got that firmly understood, then the funding will match. So the daily activities core funding will be enough to cover the activities that you want them to do. And then the SIL will cover the rest of your 24 hour period so that you've got 24 assistants to call on, um, which is in place at a site like Palm Beach. Right, okay, that's a great explanation because I wasn't clear about how that worked. So you actually have to sort of have a, a little bit of a plan in your, in your head about what you want certain people to be able to provide. And then you have to sort of paint that picture for the NDIS so that um, they can provision for that in your funding. Um, so when you move into your SDA, that doesn't set up, that doesn't activate a plan re review either, does it? That, that's the all move, done beforehand. The move um, will be a change of circumstance. Um, right. What we tend to find is that once you've got your SDA funding, which doesn't cause a plan review, um, and you submit your fuel quote, the SIL funding will trigger an automatic plan review, and that's when you build in the change of circumstance say, here's my plan to move, this is the rough time, and here's the things that I'll need in order to live um, with appropriate supports in that new environment. And the timing around that, does that happen? Like within a matter of sort of days or weeks prior to moving in? Like, I guess you must have a date where you're gonna occupy the dwelling. So and that's the plan? We try to line it up like that. Sometimes it can be a little, because there are a few different moving parts. Um, and a few different teams in the NDIA that are involved. So it's not all handled by one particular team that can sort of line it up. Um, we try to make it as smooth as possible, but we, we need a little bit of flexibility in terms of dates. Generally what we find, so the average that I sort of find with the people I support is um, we'll get the SDA funding come through. Um, we'll do the SIL quote for them in roughly a week period after that SDA comes through. Um, once that's submitted at the end of that week, it's about four to six weeks before that comes back and is approved by the NDIS, triggering that plan review. Um, and then there is a couple of other steps for a brand new property that you need to do um, before moving in. So one of those things is an environmental assessment with an OT. That's you nice. and yeah, attending the property together to have a look and see if there's any customizations or modifications or additional equipment um, that you yourself need to live as safely as possible there. That's a great point. So we might as well, while you're on that subject, you give, give us a bit of an idea um, around what's involved there. So obviously you'll, um, you'll ask the AT in your plan to move into your new SDA. Um, and what's that process like? Similar to the SIL, I guess? 
Not, not quite like the SIL. Um, it's a lot is dependent on that environmental assessment that occurs with the OT. So you might have some assistive technology that you require that you know well before moving in because you need it no matter which property you move to. That might look like things like a, I suppose, a new wheelchair or a new power wheelchair or a new scooter um, that you might be requiring so that in terms of assistive tech. Um, when it comes to the environmental assessment, that's when they look at things like you need a door opener because of course high physical supports provisions for that to be installed. Um, but the installation itself, the cost of the actual device and the service and the maintenance comes through an individual's NDIS plan. Um, I suppose one of the biggest pieces of work that can happen in a high physical supports apartment through that environmental assessment is that if that person needs a ceiling hoist installed, um, because again, high physical supports provisions for the ceiling hoist, it's all reinforced, there's no wires in there, it's all clear and ready to be installed. Um, but if you don't require a hoist at the time that you move in, you don't need to have the tracks and the hoist installed just to be you know, a beautiful um, yeah. ceiling feature in the meantime. So, <laughs> so it can, you can literally move in prior to some of those things that actually being ready. Exactly, that's what the environmental assessment helps you determine. What's a must have before you move? what's something that can be installed after you've moved in um, and we'd also help you with things like higher equipment so if there's a big piece of tech like a hospital bed that you're acquiring before you move in to live there safely we can look at using your ndis funds with you um, to hire to hire that piece of equipment which can also double as a bit of a trial which is nice sometimes um, before it gets actually funded by ndis and delivered to your home right okay and then so all oh, is tracking well um, you know you've got you're still in your plan, you've got your SDA in your plan, obviously, um, and you've got a move-in date. And then, so what is the process around moving in, I guess? That's probably part of the, the, um, the whole scheme that's probably the scariest for people is moving house. You know, like, there's a big task involving that. Moving know. house, it's a gigantic task for anyone to move from one place to another with all your belongings. Um, let alone having additional needs like um, some very specific equipment requirements. So um, we do work with individuals in order to help come up with a bit of a transition plan from where they are to where they're going. And it's so individualized that it's hard to give, I guess, a general answer because it really depends where you're coming from, um, what equipment you currently have, what equipment you currently need and what modifications you need in your apartment. Um, but we work with some basic stuff. We do some, some checklists for you. Um, we do, I've got a bit of a document about things to think about in that planning meeting that you have that might be funded through NDIS versus things you need to start thinking about um, funding through your own means. So your cutlery and your, your forks and your, so a lot of people, depending on where you're coming from, might have heaps of that stuff. Um, if you're coming out of other group homes or you're coming out of a nursing home, for example, you might not have as much of those day-to-day -day, um, regular pieces of you know, toaster, kettle, that sort of thing. So we, we help you um, organizing what you need straight away. And then it's up to you how you want to decorate, um, you know, where you want to put the couch. You know, that, that's, that's very much an individual thing that you get to choose. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. And then I guess, you know, and it still activates from, from day one in the sense that, you know, you move in and there's someone there sort of 24-7 or, or as you've planned to. Um, and then, so what are some of the things that people can ask for in that plan, you know, that... that yeah. MSQ can provide. What are some of those sort of day-to-day -day services? It's extremely flexible. So some people have requested that we do all of their supports through their civil funding, which means that we put an additional staff member up there for the times that you need one-on-one -on -one supports and they're on call ready for us to do anything throughout your entire day. So personal care, meal prep, um, you know, those, those emergency supports, like you've dropped the remote on the floor, you can give us a buzz and we can come and help you pick that up. Um, we're there all the time and we can do all of your supports. Sometimes it looks like us doing the minimum. So maybe you have a scheduled provider or a previous provider, um, or maybe you individually contract your support workers and you want them to do most of the supports for you. Um, they could do, you know, from 7 a.m. all the way through to 6 p.m., maybe with a couple of breaks in between or some community access in between. Um, and then overnight, you can call on the, the staff in the, um, the concierge unit in order to support you. Um, we're also there to be that second person if you require that for your transfers. So instead of trying to provision, which can be quite a difficult thing to, to coordinate for someone from your preferred provider to come in for the 15 minutes that you need to be hoisted, for example, um, you can call on the concierge service that's already in there. Um, it can be a mix as well. So I've had some people say, you know, I'd really like my preferred provider or my individual support worker that I contract to come in and, and help me wake up and do the meal prep and some cleaning. Um, but then after that, in the afternoon, 
my afternoon looks different every single day. So I'd like the concierge to be the ones that I call upon in order to do maybe some dinner prep or um, when you want to have a shower in the afternoon instead of the morning. So that's very much part of that conversation and, and goes into those quotes that we do for the NDIS and it can be extremely flexible so we can make it look different for different people. And I'm still I'm learning myself, so, so bear, bear with me, but is there a, a typical time, time, say, where seal changes, changes from sort of, sort of um, um, primary active, active care, care to, to concierge overnight sort of care? Like, yeah. is that, is that, Generally, I find that um, in my experience before, a lot of people used the concierge supports in order to do the last transfer into bed, for example, because they didn't know exactly each night when they actually wanted to, to get into bed and get ready to go to sleep. Um, so I typically found, and again, there's no real typical answer because we can make it very flexible, um, about 9 o'clock, 10 p.m. Um, is when we'd have, I'd say, 95% of the support sitting with that concierge service rather than with your primary provider. So 9 p.m. clock's over. Um, we'll have an awake overnight shift of likely two people, but it depends on the people living there and what their support needs are. Um, they're ready to be buzzed if you should need anything overnight. Typically, the next time where primary providers would come in, most commonly it was those morning shifts, which generally started between six and nine. Yep. So yep. if you're a night out, you can stay up late. Like, like, but if you're a night out, you can say, oh, I want to get up, get up, you know, whatever time in the morning to get going. Get going. So you yes. can sort of tailor it both ways. That's right. The beauty of it is leaning on those um, the civil supports for those times where you don't know when you're going to be doing certain things or you might change from day to day it means that they're just there on site to be called for when you actually decide to wake up because i know for me it's different every single day particularly on the weekends <laughs> so having, having someone yeah, pop in at a certain time you know whilst it's good in terms of structure and schedule it might not be what you're looking for every single day yeah, yeah. and is and there a limit to how many times i can drop my remote <laughs> <laughs> no, life happens. So we're yeah. just there. We're just there for when those things do occur. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 